Uh, last night, I, I sense the Lord gave me a word, and the, he reminded me of the word in Jeremiah, where uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, was talking about the priests uh, in that day who were declaring, well, actually, the, the word says that they have healed his people a little. And then they declare, peace, peace, but the Lord says there is no peace. And so I, I think a lot of times what the Lord is saying, sometimes that we as a, as, as a people, uh, that we sometimes uh, do not uh, test our faith, do not take a look deep down within, because there may be some things that have gotten in the way of our love for God. And then he reminded me about the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was a very powerful church, and it was a very successful church. It was a big church. And the, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy when he was ministering at Ephesus, and he said, he told him, he said, don't be as concerned with the people who say that you're too young. You're not able to uh, handle this ministry. And then after that, there was even the uh, apostle John, who was there, the uh, great apostle John, whom God used tremendously, and he was the bishop of Ephesus. And they had, they had just about everything. That church had just about everything. I mean, it seemed like uh, they, were, they were moving very strongly in, in, uh, in influencing the city and so forth. And actually, the Apostle John, uh, history tells us that he actually, when he, he entered in, eventually entered into the temple of the great goddess Diana, which was controlling the city of Ephesus. And he actually went in there and uh, that he cursed that that goddess Diana, and when he did, half the temple fell down. And uh, the, so the, it tells us that the, the principalities and powers over the region were actually being dealt with. Now, it sounds like a powerful church, but then when we get over into Revelation, the warning that Jesus gave to the church of Ephesus was, you have left your first love. You have left your first love. In other words, you could have all the greatest preachers in the world. You could have the greatest worship team. You could have all the, the things that could ever matter when it came to a worship service and still lose your first love. And what a tragedy that would be in order to lose your first love. In order, uh, we get caught up in all the paraphernalia and all the trappings of everything we do, but yet we lose our first love, the love of Jesus. And uh, actually, in the book of Revelation, the Jesus rebuke says that they, you've left your first love. And he says, now I want you to go back unless you repent and do the first works. What are the first work, works? What were the works? What did you sense when you first got saved, when you first come into the kingdom of God? Were you excited? Did you love Jesus? Were you just, you just wanted to talk about Jesus? You were just kind of wrapped up in the fact that Jesus had come into your life? He had saved you. He redeemed you from a devil's hell. You were so excited about that. Jesus says, go back to that. Remember. Uh, and when you go back to that, and when you look at where you're at today, Jesus said, look how far you have fallen. So he said, let's go back to our first love. Let's go back to appreciating everything that he has done for us. And I believe that this is a is word, not, not just for our church, but for the church in general. Uh, that the Lord is, is uh, asking us to examine ourselves, go back to our first love. If we don't, the scripture says, I will come. Jesus said, I will come and remove my uh, lamp from you, from your midst. We, Lord Jesus, we're praying, don't ever bring, let us get to this place where you, we lose your presence. Amen? Amen? Well, the word of God is living, is powerful, is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is living. It's alive. There's life in the Word. And as we look into the, the Word this morning, we know that there's going to be life imparted. And uh, as we receive the Word, we receive life. And we're going to talk about a particular kind of life this morning. But say this with me. Father, we receive now the life of your word, the life that comes from your word. We receive faith imparted to us as the word of God is released in the name of Jesus. 
I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. I believe the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> what I want to talk to you this morning about is a, uh, well, it's a Greek word, and it's, uh, the Greek word is zoe, Z-O-E, and it is, it means absolute fullness of life. It means life that belongs to God or life as God has it. It is a, a word that describes God, not only uh, who he is, but it's a word that gives us a glimpse into what life is like in God's eyes, uh, how God experiences life. And we know from the Bible that the, the word of God says that God is spirit. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is spirit, that means the life that he lives comes from that realm of the spirit. I mean, he is, he is life itself, and uh, he has come that we might experience the kind of life that he lives, the zoe life, the, the life that is different from everyday life that, that mankind lives. Uh, he has come, Jesus has come, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So let's uh, begin this morning at Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, and uh, Jesus is talking about those who will make it into heaven and those who, who will make it into uh, experiencing the God kind of life. It says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, to Zoe, to that God kind of life. And there are few that find it. There are few who actually enter in and begin to experience the God kind of life. Uh, often we think, you know, well, we're doing life, we're, we're healthy and we're doing good and, and we're experiencing life and so forth, and we, we think that uh, this is it. Well, we're, we're blessed now because of things happening in our life. Maybe finances are good and maybe even family relationships are good and, and we think, you know, this is as good as it gets. Well, I want to assure you, unless you're experiencing the God kind of life, the Zoe kind of life, then there's more to be had of God. And, of course, there will always be more to be had head of God. We'll never reach that pinnacle where uh, we run out of uh, experiencing the goodness of God because he is so good. He goes beyond our imagination, beyond our, our physical mind is able to think. He does beyond what we can think or, or imagine. And one of the things is that he, he desires, he has come, that we might have zoe. And again, it says, few there be that find it. Well, there, there's few that really take the time to uh, make a decision that they are going to live a different kind of, of lifestyle. They are going to yield to the Zoe kind of life that God has for us. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And in him was life. Everybody say life. Now say zoe. Because that's what that word, that Greek word there is zoe. And there's a number of words that are translated life in the Greek, but we're talking, we're going to talk about that word uh, zoe this, this morning. In him was life, in him was zoe, and the zoe, the God kind of life, was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it, uh, did not comprehend it. In other words, the life of God comes in Jesus. In him was life. He carried this life of God. And he was able to carry the life of God because he was born into this world, and he was the only uh, man that ever was born, only human that was ever born uh, without sin, who lived his life without sin. So he was able to all the time uh, live connected to the Father the way you and I were created to live. We were created to be continually connected with our Heavenly Father. We were actually created so that the life of God would be continually flowing into our lives. And of course, when Adam and Eve fell and they, they sinned, that life flow was cut off. But we know from the Word of God that when Jesus was raised from the dead, and I'm so thrilled to be able to celebrate Resurrection Sunday next Sunday. I'm just excited about that. It's, bringing, it's like bringing new life into our own lives, Resurrection Sunday. And, 
And uh, Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, and he met with his disciples, and the Bible says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so again, that connection, that connection that uh, mankind was able to have with the Father, that he would be flowing his life into them. And the Scripture says that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And so we have to have this connection to the Father and able to be able to experience the God kind of life. Hallelujah. I'm so thrilled that you and I don't have to go through this life without experiencing the God kind of life. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who are going to wait until they get to heaven before they have any concept of what the God kind of life is. But we don't have to wait. We can experience it here and now. We can experience on this earth. And as we experience it, uh, life, the life of God on earth, we're experiencing a little bit of heaven on earth. We're experiencing heaven on earth. Now, I believe God wants us to experience that. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to have to wait. Take you all to heaven before you're going to be able to experience it. I, I want you to pray that my will that is done on heaven, I that it will come to earth, that we'll be able to experience it here on earth. So Jesus, in him was Zoe. In him was life. In him was the life of God. And in John 10, 10, it says, The thief, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have Zoe. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he wants us, it, it seems to me that God is saying that there is a life, there is a, a God kind of life that we can grow into. He said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I believe that life comes as a seed. It comes as a seed in us. And what we do with that seed depends of how, on how much of God we experience how much of God's life we experience. We can receive a seed and uh, allow weeds to grow around it, allow things to come into it, uh, and uh, stifle the growth of it. But if we treasure that seed, if we water that seed, if we do things that will cause the growth of that seed, then the life, the zoe of God, we will experience it more and more on a daily basis. It will be increasing. And of course, in the kingdom of God, things are set to multiply. In the kingdom of God, uh, things that God has set in place, he gives us as a seed, but he wants us to multiply it. He wants, us, wants it to grow in our lives. And it's the same th thing with the life of God, the Zoe God. He wants us to, to come to him in such a way that will allow the growth of what he has placed on the inside of us. And the, and the Bible speaks very clearly that we have the life of God in us. But are we experiencing it? That's the question. Are we experiencing it? I, you know, if I had a, a, somebody brought me a brand new Lamborghini and it was sitting out in the driveway, that would be wonderful and it would even be fun to look at it. But it, it would be disappointing if you couldn't drive it. It really, it'd be disappointing if you couldn't experience it. It'd be disappointing. Well, the life of God, we can look at it and so forth, but are we experiencing it? Is it, are we allowing it to, to take part of our lives so that we will actually live the kind of life that God wants us to live? He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Come that you might have Zoe, the God kind of life. Matthew 19, 16 says, now behold... There was a rich young ruler who came to him. He said, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may in gain eternal zoe? Now, the word zoe encompasses uh, eternity, but it means more than just continuing. It is, it's, a, it's a quality of life as opposed to necessarily a, gen, a, a longevity. It is longevity, but it is also a quality of life. Life as God has it. And uh, in uh, verse uh, 17, it says, So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter life, if you want to enter into Zoe, keep the commandments. So Jesus was living under the law, and he lived his life under the law, and he told him, If you, if you want to live, if you want to experience the God kind of life, than keeping commandments. Now, he had to be talking about a life that was greater than just living and breathing, a body that's living and breathing, because the, the rich young ruler already had that. 
He was already alive. And so, but Jesus was talking about another life. He was talking about another quality of life that this rich young ruler was not experiencing. He may have ex been experiencing the best of life that this world could offer. But Jesus said, there's another life. There's another kind of life. There's a greater life than what you've experienced. I believe that's, that's why some people uh, who have everything that this world could offer, they have all kinds of, of money, anything that money could buy, they have, and they have it all around them and so forth, but often they're miserable. Why? Because they've had the, they were experiencing the best that this life has to offer, while, and, and that brings them to a place of, well, uh, what's life all about then? Because this still doesn't satisfy me. There's still something on the inside of me that tells me that, is this it? Is this all there is? Is this, can I, you mean I'm not going to get anything more out of life than what I've got right now? Well, God says there is. Uh, he, can, he can move us into a place where we're having a life that we can imagine. He, we can, he can move us into a life that is abundant, the God kind of life. So we see that Jesus is saying, I have something to offer that the world can offer. In John 17, 2, it says, As you have given him, Jesus, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal zoe to as many as you have given me. It, this is a, a prayer that Jesus was praying. And he's saying, You have given me the zoe, the God kind of life. Now I give it to whomever I choose. I don't know about you, but I feel chosen. Don't you? I feel chosen. I feel chosen because God has imparted to me the God kind of life. I carry it on the inside. And you carry it on the inside as well. And somehow that, that Zoe, that God kind of life, God desires for us to get it out there. Get it out there. To experience it. And so other people can, can see it. Well, uh, John 4:14 4, says this. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. You remember the story about Jesus met the woman at the well? And it says in verse 14, But whoever, whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a well of water springing up into everlasting or zoe life, the God kind of life. The, the water that I give him. So Jesus was talking about now the Holy Spirit. He was talking about uh, giving the Holy Spirit to individuals, uh, the water of life, giving it to individuals. And he's saying that water will become in him a well, a well springing up into everlasting life, springing up so that we might experience Zoe, the God kind of life. Uh, it becomes, it comes in us as a well. You know, a well is something that's dug and a well can be stopped up as well. A well can, be, can have things put on the top but to keep it from flowing. A well, uh, while it's meant to give us life, representing the, the life of God, it can be stopped up. Abraham uh, dug some wells in his journeys into the land of Canaan, and the, the Bible says that the Philistines stopped up some of these wells. Let's just read it in, in, uh, in Genesis 26, uh, Abraham's son Isaac it says that Isaac dug again the, the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which the father had called them. So the Philistines went, the, the enemies of, of God's people went and stopped up the wells that Abraham had dug. The wells of water that Abraham had dug. Now, those wells of water represented life to the people of the land. They couldn't live in the land without having wells of water. And there is a, a well of water that God has uh, placed on the inside of us that we can't live in this life uh, without. We can't live the life of God without this well welling up on the inside of us. There has to be, there's nourishments that come from it. There's life that comes from it. But if we stop it up with all kinds of things of this world, we'll not experience the life of God. We'll not experience the, 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 uh, the presence of God, the anointing of God, the blessing of God, the purposes of God in our lives if we allow other things to come in and stop up that well. Sometimes we have to be like Isaac and go back and dig up those wells. 
we have to go back and, and be diligent in opening those wells up again, those wells of life that maybe that we have experienced from the very beginning. And when we got saved and came into the kingdom of God, it seemed like there was a life flow there that we had never experienced before. And somehow over the years, we've allowed some things to stop up those wells, to cover up those wells so that we're no longer, we no longer have the zeal for the things of the kingdom of God like we used to. Glory to God. I know I'm going fast this morning, but I feel like I've got a lot of stuff to say in a short time. <laughs> the, life, the life of God in us is to influence, and we cannot, we cannot allow ourselves to allow those wells, those wells of water within us that are supposed to be springing up into Zoe life, into the God kind of life. And if we're not experienced, it's like we need to ask the Lord, Lord, how have I stopped up the well? How have I put a lid on it? What are some of the things I can do in order to unstop the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Glory to God. I believe every one of us can, can go there and ask the Lord, what is it? What is it, Lord, that's stopping us? Now, we were excited. As I say, we we're excited when we come into the kingdom of God because we get to know the, some of the things of the kingdom of God. We were all really excited because we have revelation of the goodness of God. But life's difficulties come. And it comes to us all. Every one of us. Life's difficulty comes to us all. And how we respond to those difficulties will determine the degree of the life of God we'll actually experience in our lives. We all respond one way or another. We'll respond in a, in a way that will either enhance the flow of the life of God in our lives or we will become bitter and we will become joyless. We will lose our zeal. And it's up to us. You see, the, the difficulties of life do not have to keep us down. It is our attitude toward the difficulties of life that will keep us down. It is our attitude of unforgiveness, of bitterness, and so forth that will stop the flow of the blessing of God into our lives. But we have to be like Isaac and begin to dig those wells. You know, the, the, the name Isaac actually means a laughter. And laughter, of course, is connected with joy. And in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or difficult situations. Count it all joy. And there's a reason for counting it all joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work so that you may be complete, lacking nothing. The way we get complete and lack nothing is to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Why would we call it all joy? When, why, would we, why would we consider it joy? Well, we can only consider it joy when I lost my farm, lost my home, lost uh, basically everything that this world had to offer. I, it was a difficult thing to be joyful in the midst of that. But I had to make a decision. Am I going to count it joy or not? Or am I going to get into, a, into the doldrums and, and just absolutely become bitter because of what happened? Or am I going to allow the Lord to move in that situation? Am I going to believe that God, God works all things out together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose, and that he predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So I can say, Lord, I count it all joy. I count this trial joy because you are using this trial in order that I might be conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not our main goal in life, then we need to shift our main goal because it should be to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he is the firstborn among many brethren. He wants you and I as a part of his family walking with him. And so one of the ways that I believe that we can really unstop the well of uh, <coughs> unstop the well that produces life, that produces the God kind of life is to experience or be determined that we are going to live a joyful life. Uh, we are going to experience joy in this life that we are in. The scars of the past may have produced a wound, and that, that wound may have produced some things in you that, that uh, is holding you back. It could be produce uh, bitterness in your life, and that is stopping up the well, or the scar can also uh, be scabbed over and produce healing in your life as well. But it's up to us. 
Whatever we allow that to do, whatever, wherever we go with God when it comes to a difficult season in life. And that season is not all about you. It's not all about you. It's not, you know, one of the main things, and, and Stephen actually alluded to it, one of the main things that the devil uses is that we think it's all about us. We think, you know, if something terrible happened to us and uh, we, we usually blame somebody else, We'll, you, we'll put the blame off on, on, on somebody else. And so we attempt to live a, a, a God kind of life or even a life that is anywhere near happy. We attempt to do that without taking responsibility of our own situation. We put it off on somebody else. And long as we put it off on somebody else, we'll never be able to deal with it because we can only deal with what we take responsibility for. But when we take responsibility for any issue that might be in our life, we can then come to the Lord. We can lay it out before the Lord. We can ask him to forgiveness. We can ask him to cover us with his glory. We can ask him to release us from all shame, from all destruction, anything at all that is keeping us away from the life of God. But as long as we're putting it off on somebody else, Oh, we, could, we can't come before the Lord with somebody else. And, 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 and as I mentioned last week, I couldn't come before the Lord in, in my marriage when it wasn't good and say, Lord, change Debbie. I mean, that, 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 as, as often as I did that, it didn't work because I couldn't change that. I tried. But when I took responsibility for the situation, then I had to change that. Lord, change me. Change me, God. Change, but do something with her too, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> we must unstop the well of joy that resides in our spirit because it is, it is in there. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God of my salvation. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For, yeah, the Lord is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, there's work to draw on water from the wells of salvation. I mean, it wasn't like today uh, when we have uh, all our wells, we just turn on a, a faucet and the, and the water comes and there's, there's not really much work to it. But when this was written, you had to get a bucket, you had to go to the well, and if the well was deep, you had to draw it up. There was something that you had to do. And the Bible says that we are to draw joy from the wells of our salvation. So we have a part to play in that. We have, and, and I believe that simply means that when you think of your salvation, when you think what you've been redeemed from, when you think of the uh, salvation that God has brought to you, that can bring you joy. When you meditate on that, that can bring you joy. Boy, I, I can get joyful. I can get really joyful when I think of what I've been delivered from and delivered into. And I can think of I don't have to die and go to hell. I can make it to heaven. I know that I have a home in heaven. Man, that can get you joyful. That can get you shouting in the middle of a real depressed time. You, you, with joy, you can draw water from the wells of salvation. Because Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a matter of the things of this world but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I believe God wants us to use joy in order to unstop those wells of life, unstop those things that, that are holding us back. The joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah said. And we need strength. The church needs strength. And the church needs to uh, enter into a new level of the joy of the Lord. Having, now, it talks about his joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So it's his joy, the same way it is, as it's his faith that got you into the kingdom in the first place. When I cried out to Jesus, I, this is my cry. Lord, I don't know whether you're real or if you're not, but if you're real, come into my life. I don't want to die and go to hell. Well, where's my faith in that? All it was, God, was making a declaration, Lord, if you're real, I want you. I need you. I want you. And when I made that confession of faith, something happened on the inside of me. Or faith came on the inside of me where I believed that I was actually born again, that I was saved. Glory to God. So it came from him. And so the joy that we're talking about also comes from him. 
And that's why he wants us to walk so close to him, because what we desire most comes from him. It comes from his presence. He wants us to experience what he is experiencing from the Father. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And when we move according to God's design, we bring joy to the Lord, and that joy is our strength. That joy gives us authority. That joy gives us power to come against the forces of darkness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord God Almighty. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Avery, I was playing praying for you. And the Lord says that you are like a, fi- like a brand plucked from the fire. That uh, the enemy thought he had you, but you turned around and that you've been plucked from the fire, and that the Holy Spirit has already been moving in you to show you life. And as you continue with him, the Zoe, the God kind of life that's on the inside of you, is going to raise up more and more. And you know what? Your purpose in life will be determined from what he thinks about you. Because he loves you, he cares about you, he desires for you to run with him. And as you run with him, you'll experience a God kind of life like you never dreamt of. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. His joy in us shifts us so that we can experience joy in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty. His joy in us will wipe away everything that's keeping us from experiencing the life of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I get preaching for a while, and the anointing gets on me, and I I just begin to experience the life of God more and more, and it gets me happy. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And uh, the psalmist in in Psalm 51 says, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Now, the thing is, in that verse, we have to realize that if we are not experiencing the joy of our salvation, we're not going to be teaching transgressors. We're not going to be Come and bring people into, into the kingdom of God. You see, it's the joy of the Lord that will get the attraction of the world. Not, go, not walking around and just uh, thinking about all the things that you can't do if you're a Christian. No, it's the joy of the Lord, the joy that he will see on our, that the world will see on our faces that will bring people to Christ. Now, when the, the uh, martyr Stephen, you'll remember Stephen, he was the, the first martyr in, in the book of Acts. And uh, he, was, he was preaching to uh, the Pharisees. I mean, they hated him, but yet he was preaching. And there was something, uh, he preached quite a long sermon, and there was something that kept them back, the, the religious folk of the day, there was something that kept them back from running at him right away and stoning him to death. And he did get stoned to death, but not until later on. And then he said, uh, the, the, uh, Stephen looked up, the Bible says that he looked up into the heavens and he seen the Son of God at the right hand of the Father. He seen into the spiritual realm. He seen what life was really all about. And he was, he was able and he had a, a boldness to, and an authority to be able to speak against these uh, people who were so dem- demonically oppressed that they were willing to uh, murder him. And he went to glory. See, it was the life of God in him that caused him to be fearless. I mean, he knew what was going to happen to him. It caused him to be fearless as he spoke the word of God to his enemies. And he was showing love to his enemies just the way Jesus said. He said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. Well... If, we're not, if we can't do that, it's not, the life, it's not the flow of the life of God that's coming from us. We can only do that if the life of God is coming from us. Now, we can moan and complain about the difficulties of life. We can moan and, and sigh, oh, life is so hard. Whenever that temptation comes for you to do that, I want you to think of this. What does it compare to? What does my life compare to? 
I believe every one of us in this place could think of other situations that if we looked at it, our life would be pretty good. If we compare it to some other situations, our life would be pretty good. And it gives us reason to be so thankful and to re rejoice in the Lord. Luke 10, 10, 19, Behold, I give you power, authority, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be by any means harm you or hurt you. This is the Zoe, the God kind of life that gives us that ability. It is the God kind of life that gives us, it's not knowledge. It is the God kind of life. If we rely only on knowledge, we'll be like the seven sons of Sceva. In the book of Acts, the seven sons of Sceva were people, were, were people who went about casting out devils. Now, it seems like they must have had some success, but they seen the apostle Paul doing it, and he was having way more success than they ever had, so they decided that they would begin doing things that Paul did. And they went ar around and tried to cast the devils out of an individual and, and said, uh, told them to come out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And then the Bible says that that devil said, we, Paul, we know, Jesus, we know, but who are you? And it jumped on those, those seven brothers and beat the tar out of them. And they left the house naked. Now, they must have been beaten pretty bad. They lost all their clothes. No, those seven sons of Sceva didn't have the life of God residing on the inside of them. They just seen it in Paul. And it's one thing. Now, listen. Yes, the life of God resides on the inside of you. But take notice. Take notice in whom you rub shoulders with. Because as the life of God is displayed in others, it can be imparted to you in new ways. There can be limitations taken off of you just by the impartation from another who knows how to walk with my spirit, says the Lord. For the days are coming when I'm raising up a church where all will know how to walk in the spirit. And it's in the spirit where you will see the accomplishments of my Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the spirit where you will rise up and you will take authority in the precious name of Jesus, and you will rise above. You will rise above your circumstance. You will rise above that which is holding you back for so long. You, you will rise above the life of this world and enter into a new stage. For you see, your journey in becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ is an ongoing process, and as you move toward me, you will move toward the direction of the Holy Spirit. For there will be a church that the Lord is coming back that is without spot, without wrinkle, and it will be a glorious church that the Lord is thrilled to be the leader of, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Now, this is the, that's part of the reason why the church that Jesus is coming back for is a church that's going to be united like precious faith. There'll be no arguments. There'll be no offense taken. There'll be no people. There'll, there'll not be people who are getting offended because they see something they never understood before. They'll not be like the people in Jesus' day when Jesus brought in the, the uh, communion. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You have no zoe in you. And the Bible says that the people left Jesus because they couldn't understand what Jesus had just said. Yet the disciples, they were the only ones that stayed with him. And all the rest left. Now, now think about this. They seen Jesus do many miracle, miraculous miracles. They seen him raise the dead. They seen him do so. They seen him feed thousands. They seen him catch a shipload of fish. And yet all of a sudden, all those miracles were put away. All those signs that Jesus did were no longer paid any attention to. And that one thing that they didn't understand drove them away. That one thing. 
And I believe the church is going to say, rise up to a new maturity where it will look at the fruit. And just because they don't understand does not mean they won't believe. We have to be like the disciples when Jesus said to Peter, he said, well, what about you? Do you want to leave too? And Peter says, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where will we go? There's no place else to go. You're the one. You're the Messiah. You have the words. Lord, even though I don't understand what you said, I mean, actually, to eat your flesh and drink your blood, that sounds terrible. That sounds like abomination. That sounds like against every law that we have ever, ever heard about it. But Lord, I trust you. In the midst of my misunderstanding or my not understanding, I trust you. And I'm going to run with you. I'm going to move with you no matter what. And the joy of the Lord will unstop that which the enemy is trying to hold over our well of life so that we can experience him like never before. Now, whatever you were dealing with this morning, whatever you might be going through this morning, I want you to leave it here. Leave it here. Whatever it is that you might, that, that might be uh, stopping up your well of Zoe and your well of joy. We were meant to have a zeal for life, a real zeal for life, to express Jesus in our lives, to be filled with joy. The Bible, Jesus said, I have, I've told you these things so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be made full. Well, if we're full of joy, then there's no room for depression. There's no room for bitterness. There's no room for anything else. Now stand with me, please. Thank you.